Good morning, church. Thank you, praise and worship. Well, it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, amen? Um, and yeah, it uh, was good to uh, spend time with the Bonagoro family yesterday, and Sister Sandy, thank you for acknowledging that. Uh, Sister Fran was very special to this house and to many of us, of course, um, and uh, so to have that opportunity to honor her, um, and I pray hopefully comfort her family and uh, give them a time to reflect uh, and just see the impact that, you know, she clearly had on their life, but um, just everybody in, in, in this church as well. So uh, it was an honor uh, to have that opportunity and, and thank you all for those that uh, did help. I do think it was truly a, a special, really a special day. So uh, thank you all for that. Um, but bless God. Um, so this morning, uh, the title of our discussion <laughs> is uh, Thy Shield and Thy Reward. And that's in reference, uh, and thank you, Sister Helen, you actually have the scripture in the uh, bulletin there. It's Genesis uh, chapter 15, verse 1. And it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, for I am thy shield and thy exceedingly great reward. The word of the Lord. And um, this is at a time where Abraham, because it says, after these things. Well, what? just happened. What was so, you know, uh, worrisome, because he told them not to fear, that God had to pay him a visit and give him a message. Church, you ever have something that just radically maybe changes your life or impacts you and you say, Lord, can you come give me a word and just let me know everything's going to be okay? And that's exactly what God did. And I believe that's what God does. But he came to him in a vision. He came to him in a vision, and the very first thing he told him was to not, not to have any fear. Worry, anxiety, uncertainty about life. Does anybody have uncertainty about life? <laughs> well, don't worry. <laughs> fear not. <laughs> you have a shield, and you have a reward coming. <laughs> but Abraham had just, um, and this is actually before his name was changed, it's actually Abram. But um, this is when he had just defeated um, uh, four of the Gentile kings. Uh, if you read chapter 14, you read the account in 14, pretty familiar passage. But he has just defeated the four of the kings because they came in and there was the five Gentile kings, uh, but they turned on uh, the king of Sodom. I think it was King Bera, if I'm not mistaken. But they turned on him and they basically took, you know, his goods and his riches and, and took some of his folks. One of the folks, if you remember, was uh, Abram's son or nephew, Lot. Because Lot had chosen to live in Sodom. And so well, they got him too. So they went and told uh, Abraham, old Uncle Abe, hey, these guys, they, uh, they came in, they uh, yeah, ransacked the village, and they grabbed Lot too. And he's like, oh, that daggum Lot. I mean, how many times have you got to bail Lot out of trouble, man? I, I mean, time and time. And he tell him, hey, don't do that, he'd do it. Hey, stay away from there, he'd go over there. Hey, don't touch that, he'd touch that. Anybody feeling me this morning? <laughs> I'm Lot. <laughs> I'm touching everything I'm not supposed to touch. <laughs> and Abraham would always save him, of course, and, and that's exactly what happened. He gets his men. He goes in. He goes at night, puts a plan together, and he gets his nephew out and everything that they had taken from the king of Sodom because Abraham was a faithful servant. And while he may have been a Gentile king, the truth was his nephew was living there. And so he got everything back and he returned those riches and those items back to the king of Sodom. And then the king of Sodom was like, hey, and he wanted to give Abraham something. And Abraham said, I will not take so much as a shoelace, lest you claim that you have given me any riches other than that which has come from my father in heaven. Wouldn't take anything. Now, why did the, you know, why did King Bera want to give Abraham, you know, some of the riches? It wasn't because he wanted a relationship or liked Abraham, right? He was only given it because of what he could get. And Abraham obviously was not going to be duped. He was not going to be fooled. If there was a true relationship, that might have been one thing, but that wasn't it. He just wanted to see what he could get. It was what Abraham could give him. He really didn't want the, the relationship. Because if you later on go into the account, when he faces King Abimelech, when he is now the wretch, 
and Abimelech restores him, Abimelech gives him riches, Abraham takes the riches. So it wasn't the fact that he was a Gentile king, it was the fact of the heart, the condition of the heart. And if the heart is right, God will reward you whether they're a Gentile king or not. And he certainly took those. And remember that instance, he actually lied to the, the king. Is this here? Yeah, that's my sister, remember? And then the Lord spoke to the Philistine king, the arch enemy of Israel. He didn't speak to Abraham. Why? Because Abraham became the knucklehead in that situation. He spoke to the Philistine king and said, hey, what are you doing? You can't touch this woman. That's his wife. And the, the king of Bamelech was like, Lord, I, I had no idea. He said, I know your heart. I know you didn't know that. I know what you know and what you don't know. You don't even have to declare that to me. He spoke this to a Philistine king, not even an Israelite. Church, I know it's hard to fathom. There's over six billion people on this planet. He knows the thoughts and the intents of each and every one of us. It's, it's almost impossible to fathom, but he knows it. And he lets Abimelech know, and of course, he spares Abimelech. As a matter of fact, he says, as a matter of fact, you know what you're going to do? You're going you're gonna to take care of my boy here, and then he's going to bless you. Because Abimelech had no children. Neither did Abraham at that moment. And that's exactly what Abimelech did. Abimelech blessed him. Matter of fact, he said, hey, what do you, what do you guys want? Where do you want to stay? You want, you want this land? You want that land? And then he actually gave him a thousand pieces of silver, the Bible says. And Abimelech, and, uh, and King Abraham took him, and then he blessed him, and Abimelech was blessed by Abraham. Imagine that. The Philistine king was blessed. So maybe we're not supposed to curse him and yell at him and spit on him. Maybe we're actually supposed to bless them. Imagine that, your arch enemy. But the shield and the reward, if you'd play along with me this morning, let's, let's unravel what this shield is, okay? You're going to have to trust me a little bit, but I'll play along with you. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to close them with you, so my cousins are worried I'm going to come up there and bip them in the head. We used to bip each other. And we, well, I won't do that. <laughs> I'm going to close your eyes. Close, close, close your eyes with me. I'm going to close mine. I want you to vision God however you vision him. I don't know how big he is. I don't know if he's white, if he's bright orange, purple. He's on a throne. Vision however you want to vision him. And wherever he may be. And just pause. Envision God. Now, what's missing from that vision? The world. You can open your eyes now. The world. That is your shield, church. It's your eyelids. You close them, spiritually speaking. And that's what he was basically telling Abraham, because Abraham was worried. Why? Well, you just fought four kings. They're probably going to come after you. And you just rejected the last king. <laughs> he tried to be your friend, and you rejected him. So I'm sure he was worried about possibly retribution, because he, he did say fear not. But he said, I am your shield. I am reward. You cannot look at the natural circumstances of life. You have to have a vision from God. You have to close your eyes, not literally, but if that's what it takes for us to understand what God is talking about this morning, then praise the Lord. But we have to quit looking at the circumstances. Whether, whether you think there are five kings coming after you or not, it's not relevant. God says, I am your shield and I am your reward. I also know he's a God of order. So how do I get my reward? Well, you better know how to use your shield or ain't going to be no reward. The shield came first. Then what? Then the reward. So we got to know how to use that shield this morning. Amen. Let's take a look at Ezekiel. We seem to be, my brother and I seem to be in Ezekiel a lot. I think God is speaking to us in visions. Amen. It requires visions. And why do, the, why do you suppose it's got to be visions, church? Because if he doesn't give us a vision, we are so hung up on what we think we know and see and understand. He's got to show us something different. Something has got to be seen. It's got to be a different vision. Like how many visions do you think God has this morning? They're endless. He's got heaven. I mean, that goes on and on and on and on. And so he's got to give us some visions. And I believe God will continue to do that so that we will not look at the circumstances of our life. They could be great, they could be bad, they could be middle of the road. It's really not relevant. 
Life is relevant. The circumstances, though, and how we react, I think God is showing us you've got to see God in a vision. Remember, what does God look at? God says, yeah, I don't look at what you guys look at. I don't judge man the way you judge man. I look at what? The heart. The heart. When he chose David to fight Goliath, he didn't look at the big dudes. He would not have picked Pastor Mike and I. Just telling you right now, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't have picked us. And not to say I'm, we're saying we're big, although Michael says he's big. He's always... <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is the littlest guy in the room, that's the one God's going to choose. It's not the stature of the man. It is the heart. It is the heart of Christ. He is looking at the heart. He is never looking at the circumstances. What do you think he wants us to look at? The heart. Yeah, the same thing. He's not a confusing God. It's, uh, he, I look at the heart. How about you guys look at the heart? You know, that's what makes him God the Father. Amen. But let's take a look at this one here. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 12, uh, verse 22. Son of man. What is that proverb that ye have in the land of Israel saying, the days are prolonged and every vision faileth? What fails? Every vision I have in this earth that is absent of God is a failure. If you do not see God in the situations in your life and the circumstances in your life, it's just the natural eyes, the natural eye of man. What's going to happen? It's going to produce failure. Because you're not supposed to look at it that way. You're not using your shield. You're supposed to shield yourself from that, and you've got to see God. What, didn't you quote last week Isaiah chapter 6? In the year King Uzziah high died, right? I saw the Lord high and lifted up on the throne, and his train did fill the temple. When you go on in that account, it says, that, And I saw a seraphim, and he had six wings, and twain covered the face, and twain covered the feet, and twain did fly. The face was covered. The feet were covered. I was flying. What does that mean? I'm blind? Yeah, you're blind to the world. You're not blind to God. You're not blind to faith. That is the point. But you are flying. It's not about where you're walking, the circumstances that you see. That's what God shows you. What did they say? Holy, holy, holy. They didn't see trouble. They, didn't, they weren't worried about five kings trying to come and take take them out or whatever. They didn't see problems and complaints and they, they didn't, no, they just said, holy, holy, holy. It is the completion of the separation from us and the world. It's when I just live beyond this realm and I live in the heavens with Father and I say, Lord, give me a vision. He covers our face, church. He covers our feet. But we are flying. What are we? Man, I think we're just the Avengers of the universe, man. He's just, we're just going to fly into every situation where they may be blind and actually give them what they need, which is Jesus Christ. It's that old Andre Crouch song. Jesus is the answer for all the world today. Above him there's no other. And Jesus is the way. There is no other answer in life that is universal, that will correct and fix everything in life other than Jesus Christ. We have got to be the angel with the face covered and the feet covered, but we are flying, church. We are flying. Somebody's got to see things differently. Somebody has got to have a vision from God. It requires faith. No, it won't make sense in the world. That's why you got to be holy, holy, holy. You got to be separated and called out. Amen? Amen. Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. Something says that's going to stop and that it's not going to fail no more. Why? Because I'm going to have a new vision. It's going to actually have effect in life itself. What is the vision, church? It is the compassion of Jesus Christ. He said that's the only thing that makes a difference in this world. Compassion. Yet we gloss over it so easily and so simply. We think, I don't know what we think. I just get lost on my way to the bank to make my deposit. <laughs> it's compassion, church, but he's saying I'm going to change it. 
What's God doing here in this vision? He's going to change how we see life. He's got to change the way we look at life. That's the change. For there shall be no more any vain vision nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. Didn't Isaiah say that in that chapter? I am undone, Lord. How do you fix them? He took the coals from the fire and touched his lips. Don't say you're undone. Say you're holy, holy, holy. The Lord has changed you, amen. For I am the Lord, I will speak in the word that it shall speak and shall come to pass. God's going to make this thing happen. You can't change it. You can't stop it. It just is what it is. The kingdom of God is, period, present state of mind. <laughs> He's going to do this. And what? It shall no more be prolonged. I've held on long enough, world. It's time for change. Wasn't that the song yesterday for your mom? Change is going to come. Boy, ain't that the truth. For in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word and I will perform it, saith the Lord God. I'm going to speak it. I'm going to perform it. What if Phil doesn't perform it? It doesn't matter. God's going to perform it. Amen. Why? Because sometimes I'm a rebellious house. I'm a rebellious little. Woo! If I told you once, I told you twice, I told you a thousand times. Nobody would ever rebel against God, right? Just the preachers are rebelling. <laughs> Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, behold, they are the house of Israel say, the vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesieth of a time that is afar off. You mean there's going to be a new vision that we're going to see? It's going to be for many days? Like, is it going to go on to, for eternity? Is that, many, is that the kind of days we're talking about? <laughs> and how far off is it? Oh, it's so far off, it's got to reach the heavens, church. It's faith, man. He's telling you. He's telling you right here how he's going to do it and how we're going to live it. It's through faith. It's through eyes of faith. He's talking about Calvary. What opened up the windows of heaven and given us another vision? It is Calvary itself. There is no other way. Jesus is still the answer. The same, my Bible says, yesterday, today, and forevermore. When will the answer change? Well, according to Scripture, it can never change. Can I get an amen on that one? Amen. Yeah, that's right. It can't change. Therefore, say unto them, thus saith the Lord God, there shall none of my words be prolonged anymore, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, says the Lord God. And he is speaking of Calvary right there. Again, it's just, it just the words God speaks, whether they're 6,000 years old, a million, it doesn't matter. It just hasn't come to pay. He, again, he, he, there's no time in God's world. He is eternal. He created time for us. What? To drive us crazy, that's all. <laughs> it just hasn't happened yet. But he knows it's a done deal. Whatever hasn't happened in your life yet, it's okay, church. He knows it's a done deal. What he, what's he want us to do? Shut your eyes and believe and trust him. Even though you haven't seen it yet. Doesn't he say that? No eye has seen, no ear has heard. But then why are we surprised? I mean, he tells us and we just, you know, we make fancy songs and sing them and then we just go out here and we just lose our mind anyway. No, just the pastor's losing the mind out there. You guys are wrong. <laughs> He's changing the way we look at life, the way we look at the world. You got to use your shield, church. You got to use your spiritual shield. You've got to see life differently. You can't look at the circumstances because if you do, you won't. Do essentially, you won't have this effect. The effect, again, it, I believe he's talking about compassion. Whenever you read the accounts of Jesus, when he was with the sinner, he's with the blind people, the crowds, they were, he says they were scattered abroad, they were cursing him. It says he looked with compassion. He looked with compassion. He didn't see all of that hot mess. That's not what he saw. What did he see? He saw the heart that was in need of compassion. Why do the heathen rage? They rage because they don't know that Christ dwells inside of them. 
They think I'm, they're supposed to war with me. They're supposed to war with you. They're supposed to reject you. They're supposed to hate you. Our own families, though father and mother forsake thee, the Lord will take thee up. Why? Because we don't know. We, we need our shield to protect us. We need, we need a vision from God to change us. So that you can be that avenger. What? And offer compassion. Doesn't he say that? If, you, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. You're supposed to have a relationship with your enemy. I mean, if you're eating with them and drinking with them, that to me, church, that's a relationship. Not hate them and curse them. You've got to look past that and you've got to see the heart of Christ. And in doing so, what? You heap coals on their head. You will, they will get this vision of God. They will be changed. It's not that you're just going to burn them up and then say, eh, on you. That's not what God's talking about there. It's a change. He's, cha he's transforming the mind through what? Through love. What changes my mind? How do you change my mind when you love me? What, you, you, you curse me, you're going to change my mind? That doesn't work, church. Through love. He says, don't be overcome with evil. Overcome evil with good. With love, with love, with love. But if you look at the circumstance, if you look at the situation, you won't do that. You got to say, Lord, I need a shield. I need a shield. Ephesians talks about that. It is the shield of faith. We think it's just, to, you know, you know, shields up, Sulu. We're at war. You know, incoming. They might be incoming, but you got to be outgoing. With what? With love. There's always going to be incoming. <laughs> That's just life. We got to see it differently. Amen. I want to talk about Gad this morning. Gad was supposed to be the fiercest of the 12 tribes. They were supposed to be the best in battle, the best for fighting. When you needed some help, you called on Gad, one of the 12 tribes. I mean, uh, First Chronicles, this is probably not a familiar passage because I don't like Chronicles either, by the way. <laughs> Chapter 12, verse 8. And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David into a hold in the wilderness, men of might and men of war fit for battle that could handle shield and buckle, whose face was like lions, and they were swift like rows upon the mountains. So he's telling you right there that, that the, the men from Gad, they were actually, they were fit for war. They were like, uh, like maybe the seals. You guys ever see these, these SEALs guys? Man, these guys are just unbelievable. I was, in, I was in the Navy. My brother gives me grief. It was a joke. I get it. But I took, this, I took the initiation test for the SEALs test. I failed it. I did the run. I did the push-ups. I did the physical. They stuck me in a pole. You're supposed to swim for like 30 minutes straight. I can't, I can't swim for 10 minutes. Boom, like a rock. I went down. All right, you're out. You don't even, I, I didn't even get a chance to go qualify. I failed it right there. <laughs> but these guys are like elite machines, okay? I mean, just incredible what they have to go through. Then once you get into the, at the actual program, they, they go, the training that they go through is insane. They only get like four hours of sleep a night. They're constantly grinding. And then they got what's known as Hell Week. And Hell Week, you actually get only two hours of sleep a night for the entire week. And what do you do for the other two, 22 hours? They beat on you senseless. You're freezing, you're in the water, you get very little food, you become delusional. More than half of the men drop out during Hell Week. They are not fit for battle. I think they say only of all that go in, only 20% actually graduate as a SEAL. So you can pretty much guarantee the majority that go in are going to fail. <laughs> but the 20 that come out, woo! Those are some bad dudes. Like, I'm glad this country's got some SEALs, man. Well, that's what the Gadites were. They, were. they were men fit for battle. It says here that they, they knew how to handle the shield, church. You got to know how to handle that shield. You can't just be, you know, willy-nilly and spinning it. You know, Pastor Mike, he'd be spinning it like it was a pizza pie. <laughs> and that ain't going to work. <laughs> you got to know how to handle that shield. <laughs> but what, so what do they, what do, they do with, that, with that shield? Well, let's take a look at verse 15 here. These are they that went over the Jordan in the first month when it had overflown all his banks 
and put to flight all of them in the valley, both toward the east and toward the west. In other words, so when they went in for this battle, like not only did they, they have to go in for the battle, but it was at the time when the Jordan was overflowing. So it was like this massive flood. They had, a, they had to swim through this flood just to get to the other side, to get to the battle. Like they were, before they could even get to the battle, they had to, they had to overcome this raging river. Man, that's why I thought of the seals. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's like, that's like seal stuff, man. But they still went in anyway. That, that didn't stop them. That didn't stop them. They went in, and then what did they do? It says that they, they got rid of everything. They put to flight all that were from to the east and to the west. So as far as the eye could see. Now, what do you think they put to? We've got to look at the spiritually church. Well, Psalm says that as far as the east is from the west, thou hast removed all the transgressions. What does Gad do? They go into this unbelievable circumstance that most people won't walk into, and they remove the sin out of everybody's life. Why? Because they have a shield. They have a shield. They know how to use their shield. It's called what? Go help somebody. What if they hate me? That's not the, the mission is go help somebody. He didn't ask for you to qualify it. That's what makes you a Gadite. That's what makes you a seal. You go in. Whether they like you or not is not relevant, church. How do you help them? You forgive the transgressions, church. <laughs> How do you use your shield? You forgive the transgressions. I think it's Psalms that says that the, the wicked borroweth and, and repayeth not, but the righteous are shown mercy and giveth. What makes us righteous? Well, we know we have mercy. We give mercy. That's what makes you righteous. What makes me wicked? When I don't offer you any mercy, that's what makes me wicked. I mean, I want the mercy. Don't get me wrong. I'd love, that's why I borrow some. I, can I have some mercy? Sure. You're going to pay that forward? No, I don't think so. That's what makes me wicked. In the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what makes us righteous, church? What? Not forgiving people makes us righteous? The insanity of that statement alone right there. You're like, preacher, I think you're wrong. You're right. No, what makes us righteous is the ability to have the mercy. It's the same thing that Ezekiel just talked about, that you're supposed to actually exact it upon others. You're supposed to have an effect on others. You're supposed to have an impact on others. Not reject them. Not call them out. But you got to be a Gadite. you got to know how to use your shield and go into those situations. And the only way you will, you may have to blind yourself to some things. Because sometimes church, I do, i got to just, I'm like, Phew. I just close my eyes. I'm like, hmm, I want to be like Dorothy. You know, I just want to click my ruby slippers and, you know, there's no place like home. There's no place, like, get me out of here. <laughs> Nobody else is doing that, just me. <laughs> but here's the thing, church. God does it. I don't know how he does it. I don't, know, I don't know how he comes into our lives and sets us free from those situations, but he does it. He comes in a vision and he says, I got you, man. The father and mother forsake thee. I'll take you up. Your own family don't want you. I want you. I want you. I need you. That's powerful, church. I have a shield. I got to know how to use my shield. I said, Lord, help me then. Show me, show me when to use my shield. Because the truth is, we'll, we'll walk out of here, we'll know how, but then the question is going to be, well, when? <laughs> well, I'll, hey, it works fine on Sunday from about 1030 to 12. <laughs> then the shield tends to power down <laughs> once I walk out of the church. <laughs> church? Got, shield's got to be, make sure you charge it every morning. Is it plugged in? Never mind the phone. Never mind the phone. Plug in that shield. Don't charge it up. I'm ready for the day. I don't want to step out my door without it. I know I'm a fit to see an ugly mess out there somewhere. <laughs> but bless God, I pray that God make us the Gadites, that we know how to use it. Let's take a look at Isaiah chapter 11. And hopefully continue to expand on our shield. Isaiah chapter 11, very familiar passage of scripture. Um, we're talking about, of course, the um, root of Jesse. 
And essentially what's happening here, church, is uh, we're talking about being born again. Is anybody in the house born again? <laughs> I pray we all are born again. And that's what God is talking about here, that we, we, we do have to be born again. We have to be born again. We'll be born of spirit. That's why we are the son of man, not the son of woman. Ezekiel always said the son of man. Jesus Christ was given a son of man. Does that mean we don't love our mothers? No, we, man, I, you mess with my mother, I'll kill you. It's not what he's talking about, man. What he's talking about, we're a son of man, it's God. Not son of woman, again, in the, the, the natural sense, and talking about the soul of man. You've got to be son of man. You have a duty to perform. What is that? Just to show the world some compassion and to be a seal and go into those situations and save them. But we have to be born again. So the tree gets cut down and there's going to be new life produced. There's going to be a new tree that comes forth. It is the spirit. Because then he goes in and right here in verse 2, he says, And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He's talking about the seven spirits of the Lord. It's a completion of the spirit-filled life that you and I have. We live by the spirit of God, which is to say that we use our shields and we do not let the influences of life and circumstances change how we live or what we are called to do, church. Amen? Amen. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the flesh of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So when I live by the Spirit, what do I do? Well, I'm quick to understand that God's in the center of my life. He's in the center of your life. And what do I, I'm not judging after the things that I see with my natural eyes, nor the things you say to me. Sometimes, church, you're not very nice. When I, some of the things you say, I mean, really, seriously? You know, I'm kidding. I'm not talking about you, but maybe, maybe somebody has spoken some words to you that were rather harsh. The first immediate reaction, church, is we get offended. It could, be, it could be simple things, too. It doesn't even have to be all that harsh, but we'll react real quick. That's why he says that we are supposed to be, what, quick to hear. That's quick of understanding, by the way. And slow to speak. We are quick to be obedient and trust in God and keep my mouth zipped. That's quick to hear. And don't react based on what you see. Now, how do, how do you know you're born again? I don't judge people by what I see and what I hear. I am born again. There is a new tree that has sprouted forth. It is the spirit of God in you and I. We no longer react that way or speak that way. That life has no hold on you and I. You have been redeemed. That's what redemption is, church. It's also your reward. Remember, what did he tell Abraham? Because again, it's the shield and it was the reward. Well, he didn't have any children. What did he tell Abraham? He says, I want you to do me a favor. And you can do this tonight. You go outside and he says, I want you to look up and see all those stars in the sky. Tell me if you can count them. Because that's how many children you're going to have. That was the reward. If you're married and don't have any children and that's all you want as a child, I mean... That was all that was on his heart, I'm sure. And of course, God does bless him. He becomes the great grandfather to the 12 tribes of Israel. So not only does he have Isaac, but then gave birth to the grandchildren. Man, what a beautiful reward, huh? Hmm. What a beautiful reward. But I believe this is what God is doing. Let's read here. Um, Verse 5, and righteousness shall be a girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. What's he talking about? My mind and my heart, church. Your mind and your heart. What is it, what is it girdled with? Well, it should, be, it should be righteousness and it should be faith. Righteousness is here. That is my understanding. It's how I perceive the world, and I know that we are all righteous. Why? Because the Bible says that we are all righteous. <laughs> it is the righteousness of Jesus Christ that he has made all righteous. And then what is in my heart? My heart is in, it's faith in God. I trust in God. I, I ask God for a vision. That's faith. But it's girdled about. There is, I, I, I choose no other way. Doesn't he say, don't look to the right nor to the left? This is the way, walk ye in it. What is that way? It's straight. It's straight. Remember when Paul, he was blind? 
after he got, the, he got visited by God on the road to Damascus. He was blind for three days. He didn't stay blind, church. What did he, what did he do? He said, I want you to go see a man. Where did I got to go? He said, he lives on Straight Street. Ananias is his name. Go visit him, and he will pray for you. And what? You will receive your sight. And Paul did. He went to Ananias. He went to Straight Street, and he prayed for him. And upon praying for him, Paul received a vision from God. He would no longer look at the world through the, through the, the, the eyes of the law. He would look him through the, through the heavens, through compassion and grace and mercy. He had changed his vision. Verse 6. The wolf also will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid and the calf and the young lion and the fatling, and the little child shall lead them. Now, I don't know, man. If you put a wolf and a lamb together, doesn't the wolf eat the lamb? <laughs> but when he changes my vision, church, when he changes your vision, what you realize is there really are no more enemies in life. There are no more enemies in life. He changes how you look at the world and how you see people. You can't, you can't see enemies and tell me you're born again. It's okay, God loves you, you can call yourself a Christian. I don't believe you're born again, because that's just the natural man. You haven't been born of the Spirit of God. And that's okay too, because he loves you and he's still getting you, and it doesn't matter whether you see or you don't see, he's taking you. He reigns on the just and the unjust. And before we all get proud and say, yeah, I know God, and they don't know him, and listen, he said he gives the seeing eye and he gives the hearing ear, and you ain't got nothing unless he gives it to you anyway. I thank God what I do get, but I still ain't satisfied, church. I want more. I do believe it's time for the true worshipers. We talked about that yesterday with our sister Fran, the true worshipers. What do they want? They just want more of God. They want, they want another drink out of that well. They're not satisfied. What did Jesus Christ say when he was on the cross? Didn't he say, I thirst? What do you think he was talking about, man? He was talking about more of you, more of God, more of unity more of faith. I thirst for those things. I thirst for the things of God. Will anybody thirst for the things of God? And he says it, man. He'll pour out this wellspring of water if you will truly go after him and search for the living water. What do you think he's going to hold it back from you? My kids want something to drink. I give it to them. You think he's not going to give it to you? Of course he's going to give it to you. Scripture also says that. If, you, if your child asks you for, for bread, you're going to give him a rock. Fish, you're going to give him a snake. Well, what do you think I'm going to do? I'm going to, give you, I'm going to give you 10 times better than that, church. So God says, what are you talking about? We can't have enemies, church. We can't have enemies and then believe we are born again. You need God to come rescue you and give you a vision so you can be born again and not see enemies. If you see enemies... You say, Lord, touch me. Heal my vision, Lord. That I might see as you see. That I might feel as you feel. That I might have compassion upon the world. Amen. Let's take a look at one more verse. Revelations chapter 3. This is where I feel like we've run the gamut. If we go to Revelation, I feel like... <laughs> I like messing around in Revelation. <laughs> I always like it when God gives me a, a verse in Revelation, like, ooh, it's like, I always love Revelation. Uh, chapter 3, verse 18. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in fire. Anybody want to buy gold tried in fire? Or you just want the stuff off the shelf. Hey, just give me what you got on the shelf. Not me, man. I want the stuff tried by fire. I want the stuff that I know is clean and pure and absolutely perfect. That's the stuff I want. Is that what you want? Mm. That thou mayest be rich. It means if you've got anything else in that church, you ain't rich. You need the, fire. You need the, the gold tried by the fire. Uh, that's the true riches of the kingdom of God. Amen. And white raiment, and thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness does not appear. How do we get rid of nakedness, church? 
I'll tell you how we get rid of nakedness. We quit eating from that stupid tree that the snake told us to eat from in the first place. That's the shame of my nakedness. I eat from that stupid natural tree, the good and evil. And then I wonder why I ain't got no clothes on. Somebody please tell the emperor he got no clothes on. <laughs> Stay away from the tree. Stay away from natural man. Stay away from the natural circumstances and say, Lord, give me a vision. Let me use my shield so that I won't look at life that way. Because the truth is, church, remember what the snake said. He said, God knows if you eat from that tree, then your eyes will be open. The snake always says that's a better way. It's a better vision. It's a better something. And the snake, it's not an entity, church. It's not a person, church. The snake itself is just the stupid lie I believe. It's not a person. It's not an entity. It's the lie. Why, do I, why am I tormented? I'm tormented because I believe lies. Because I believe foolishness. Because I forget there's a God in heaven and he has to shut my eyes from it all so I won't look at anything else. The shame of my nakedness. Stay out of that tree, man. Just stay out of the tree. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Do you want to see this morning? Do you want to see the way God sees? Do you want to see the heart of man? Then you need to pray, Lord, put a little eye salve on these eyes. When you look at the root word of that eye salve, it's not like it's, you know, like, you know, ladies, you put lotion or a little, I don't know, blush or whatever. It is. That's not what he's talking about. <laughs> the root word is cement. You got to cement them eyes shut. But if I cement them shut, what comes with it? Riches. White raiment. We're talking about righteousness, the righteousness of God, which means it's the righteousness not only for me, it's got to be the righteousness for everybody in my life. What else? Well, he gets rid of my shame. He gets rid of my nakedness. And you've got gold that's tried by fire. Yeah, you may have to go. Peter says that, you know, don't be, don't think, it, think it not strange when these fiery trials come upon you. Don't think it's strange. What is it? He's just, he's just getting the pure gold, church. He's trying, he just wants the gold. So then you will wear the raiment and you can actually be that Gadite. You can be that seal that knows how to use the shield. And the greatest thing we have to offer the world, church, is compassion. Not judgments. Not enemies. It's compassion. Jesus looked with compassion. He, he knew how to look past all of the circumstances and just look at the heart. Because what he knew is the heart was troubled. The heart was hurt. He's just wanting to help heal the heart, church. Help heal the heart. But if I don't shut my eyes, I won't, I won't see the heart. And instead, I'll see potentially the enemy or the circumstance or the whatever it is that we're looking at, church. Remember, in the year King Uzziah died, the Lord was high and lifted up. He was above it all. Uzziah was a good king. He reigned for, I think, over 50 years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, brought reformation to the church. You know, so maybe it's like you, when you think everything, you, you are just at the, the pinnacle and everything is great, and then all of a sudden it's, it's gone. No, 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 no. God's still high. He, he was still above him. He was, still, he was there. He's still there. <laughs> He's still there. What's he saying? Don't look at Uzziah. Yeah, he's my servant. I use, but I, me, I, I put him there. I, I, I'm gonna always have somebody there. But you, you, the eyes were the eyes are to God. The eyes are to God. You know, I think Pastor Mike touched on it. They did evil in the sight of the Lord. <laughs> oh, they did good in the sight. He's not talking about the actions again. God doesn't look at your actions. He looks at the heart. What was he looking at when those kings did evil? in the sight of God. He was looking at their heart. They didn't offer compassion. The righteous show mercy and giveth. The wicked, they hold on to it for dear life, but they don't want to offer it up to nobody else. You see, church, when you have a shield, life isn't about what you can get. Life is only about what you can give. That is the reward, church. Paul talked about that. He said, what is my reward? My reward is this, that I have the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
and that I give it to thee without charge. He didn't charge anybody. He didn't demand anything. But he just gave it freely. That's the reward. It's freely given. Because the world has a need and you have something to offer. Amen. But I pray that God will continue to give us these visions and open us up to what he is doing. I believe he's always at work in our life. Whether we see it or not, he's still at work. Just because I don't understand doesn't mean, ah, he's going to punch out. <laughs> Time to go. Phil ain't paying attention. Click. I'm punching out. I, there's a good chance I don't pay attention hardly ever. Thank God he's always paying attention. He's, we're always on his mind. Amen. I'm going to ask the worship team if they'll come. I pray God continue to uh, reveal his word to us. And I pray, make us that Gadite. Make us like that Navy SEAL. Amen. We got it. Amen. Why don't you stand while we close out? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I sense the presence of the Lord, and I always find that with this special time with a God calling home friend, that there's still a residue on the earth, you know? Can I get an amen from somebody? There's still a presence, there's still an anointing. There's something very precious when God calls his servants home. I believe it affects the heavens, I believe it affects the earth, and there's, there's nothing small about it. And I felt the presence of God has been brought into this day and therefore Michael and, and Tess with your presence here today um, it's, um, it's felt it's felt it's God ordained Amen. it's the fulfillment of what God is doing praise the Lord praise the Lord I feel the word of the Lord is for us and I, I also believe it's specifically for the Bonagoros for you Michael and for you Tess for the Lord would say fear not Fear not, for he is about to do something new in your lives. And the beautiful word of the Lord is that he will be your shield. He will be your protector. And what I read in, in the, the version that I have, it says that, it says in the one passage, he is your great reward. In this passage, it says, your reward shall be very great. <laughs> kind of like that a little better. Now I understand. <laughs> I want to have a great reward. <laughs> I believe to you first, Bonagoros, to you first, your reward shall be very great for the work that God has begun. He shall complete and perfect in the family. But I say for all of us here today, I believe his reward is very great for us. And when I found Pastor Phil as you were preaching, I was trying to take note of the blessings. But then I couldn't. It was too many blessings. In regard to the reward, it was too many blessings. And I wanted to remember them all. <laughs> it's like I can't remember them all. <laughs> but the blessings that God wants to give us are great. And they're too many to be remembered. Thank God it's not dependent upon you remembering them. <laughs> It's dependent upon him <laughs> pouring them out. So as we close, we speak to you, Michael and Tess and the Bonagoro family. You go with our blessing. And may the presence lay heavy upon you and your family. And may you know that you have a shield. For God is your shield. But he will also provide it through a people and a house. And know that God has placed you upon our hearts and we will be your shield. And we will cover you with our love and we will cover you with our prayers. Mm -hmm. May his presence abide and remain with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, O oh God Almighty, we acknowledge your presence because your presence is great. I pray. May it rest heavy upon every soul that's in the house this day. For the word has been spoken, the word of the Lord. Receive ye the word of the Lord, for he says he is your shield. Mm -hmm. And he is your reward. And your reward is great. Praise God. As we leave this house, may we lead, leave under his shadow, under his presence. 
May you be blessed. May God return us to this house safely. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Everybody says, Amen.